discussion with a very epistemic dark vision of uh, of uh, Trinitarian ontology. Uh, look, they are. This is completely completely different context. They they are usually they are European. They work in German and in Italian. They were not translated to English. There is no interconnection between these two these two uh, these two camps. They are, <laughs> frankly speaking, they do not know each other about themselves. Yes, like it's, it's they, they, they do not refer to each other. They are completely different different islands, and uh, there is no communication between these these two uh, these two areas. And that's 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 a pick. I think it, it would be very useful to uh, make some exchange between uh, these these two uh, these two islands. Uh, so, what I'm going to do now is to explore this this where this branch this way of thinking of a Trinitarian ontology and to ask about this, the, the ontological dimension of this project. What, what is the, the, the ontology we are trying to formulate? Uh, the, the, standard, the, standard, uh, the standard answer and the standard claim, the fundamental claim uh, in, uh, in Trinitarian ontology <clears throat> is that since tri Trinitarian dogma is formulated with the help of uh, uh, with the help of the concept of relation, therefore Trinitarian ontology must be a uh, relational ontology. It, 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 uh, it, it, it is repeated by everyone that uh, Trinitarian ontology put, puts a uh, relation into the heart, heart of reality, that the, the re relation which was neglected by ancient philosophy, which was uh, treated as something uh, Almost not real. Now is the fundamental, uh, uh, fundamental uh, category for not only for the Trinity, but since the world was created by Trinity for the whole for the whole world. Therefore, Trinitarian ontology must must be based on on, on on relation. Okay, and it sounds great. It sounds great for contemporary ontologists since we we know such such uh, ideas we know such claims from the contemporary uh, contemporary ontology and this is called very broadly structuralism with no reference to structuralism in french uh, theory and, and linguistic and so on it's a completely new a completely new trend structuralism this is um, uh, a view which puts exactly structure in the center uh, as the foundation structure that is a net of relations, that the relations are some are important and perhaps fundamental for uh, for reality. And we have nowadays we have two, uh, speaking generally, two domains, two areas of structuralism in contemporary metaphysics. I, contemporary metaphysics, I mean, in the last two decades, so it's really fresh, fresh, uh, fresh ideas. First is. Mathematical structuralism. They are two. These two are. They are local ontologies. Ontologies made for specific problems in specific sciences. First is mathematical structuralism. It is a theory which, which uh, asks about the nature of mathematical entities and answer that what is to be a number? What is to be a number four? What is and they, they uh, I, I think it's brilliant theory, and they say, uh, well, to be a number, that numbers have no inner nature. Numbers, have, uh, numbers are empty places, and all, the, all nature, of, the nature of numbers is, uh, it consists on relations to other places. So, the number is thought as a bundle of relations to other numbers and uh, the inner structure, the inner nature, there is no intrinsic properties of, of numbers. They are empty places, they are, well, there are, there are only relations in, in numbers. This, this is great insight. Uh, Stuart Shapiro, Michael Resnick, as you see, Michael Resnick now is Professor Emeritus and he, live, he lives in forest and uh, walks with, with his uh, this uh, Bobcat machine. <laughs> That's the, uh, yeah. Professor Emeritus of Philosophy and Mathematics. Uh, they, they are both Americans and uh, they develop this, this view. A, a fantastic view, uh, very, perhaps the most important uh, philosophy of mathematics nowadays. And this, look, this uh, well, it, we know this. Uh, I, think, I mean, uh, when, when you re recall uh, Aquinas who, who speaks about uh, Trinity and says that in person, there is nothing left without relations. 
it's exactly the same the same play as they say about uh, about numbers we, they are uh, they work in philosophy of mathematics they have no idea about trinity and about the, perhaps about about theology but their claims are strikingly similar we can we can just adopt some some their insights and and do for for the purposes of uh, uh, trinitarian ontology uh, um, Yes, abstract relation in the nihil manner. This is uh, uh, from uh, in commentary to uh, uh, sentences. Uh, this is exactly this, the same, the same, the same intuition about about them. the persons as as we have in structuralism in, 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 in uh, philosophy of mathematics. The second line, the second area, uh, the second uh, domain of uh, contemporary structuralism is so called. This is a this is a label. Ontic structural realism, or OSR. It's um, uh, it is a very influential, very very <laughs> among among uh, philosoph philosophers of science, a uh, very influential, popular uh, view. Rather, uh, it's, it's a bundle of concepts. It's not the it's not the developed theory which which, which has a uh, determined determined shape. And it, it, it was formulated by James Ladyman, this man with. On, on the left side, and, uh, and the, the, the intuition is this: it, 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 it is rooted in very empiristic view that, well, we scientists do not know the, the real nature of things. We only know relations. We only know behaviors. We only know uh, relations between phenomena. Therefore, the first the first point is: therefore, we uh, we can be agnostic about the, in, the internal nature of things, and this is epistemic structural realism. We know about we know something about the world, and uh, science is uh, is uh, speaks about the world. It's not uh, it's not anti-realistic view, but not about the inner nature, but about relations, and we do not know about the the world itself. This is it, it has a Kantian flavor. It's a uh, world is uh, thinking uh, things in themselves. We do not know the world. We don't. We know. We know only relational phenomena. But this, this is epistemic structural realism. And Lady Man goes further and says, "Well, uh, why, do, uh, why don't why don't we use uh, Occam razor if we don't know about uh, don't know about this uh, hidden world? We just we just should shave it and and say that there's nothing." Uh, and and there's, there's no things like uh, inner natures and objects, they are only relations. We just we speak about relation, therefore, there are only, we might speak about relation only, therefore, there are only relations. And this is all structural realism. Uh, a great insight in philosophy of mathematics, very useful for, uh, in philosophy of science, very useful for, uh, for them. And uh, uh, Lady Mann was first was very radical that, that there are only relations and objects are in fact reduced maybe eliminated and reduced to relations only um, it's not so crazy as it might as it might seem since uh, we, we are accustomed in, in analytic metaphysics to say for instance that the, the substance the bundle theory of object means that uh, there are no things there are only bundles of properties and it is completely normal and legitimate view. And now we have one step more and says, well, objects are simply bundles of relations, relations to other objects, which, which themselves are also bundles of relations, and so on. They are only relations in the world. Uh, very serious uh, authors, which uh, in philosophy of physics, it's, it's, it is very respectable, uh, respectable uh, view. But there are many. Um, many, many uh, more moderate uh, views also in this in this family of quantum structural realism. We have Michael Esper, is a Swiss uh, Swiss uh, uh, philosopher, and and he uh, he defended the theory which un, uh, which highlighted the importance of relations, but at the same time accept objects as as not not reducible to to to, uh, to relations. So we can we can have more moderate view that they are they are both relations and objects. Objects are something independent. They are always in relations, but they are not uh, they, they do not dis dissolve into relations. But they are we have two fundamental categories. In in Lady Man, at least in, in early Lady Man, we have we have relations on one category ontology. This this is a 
everybody wants one category ontology, and this is uh, one category ontology made, made on the on the council of relation. Uh, okay, so what would be what could be a profit of uh, linking uh, in Trinitarian ontology and, and this uh, st contemporary structuralism? Uh, first, is the is this um, is this uh, uh, Discussion about radical and moderate on ontic structural realism. Uh, again, radical means that there are only relations, and moderate uh, says that there are relations and objects, and objects are, are also must be admitted as, as, as category of being. Here's a uh, uh, we may uh, deduce <laughs> of three, three possible ontologies. Ray says that there are only objects, no relations. Uh, Modular structuralists say that there are uh, objects and relations, and radical structuralists say that there are no objects, only relations. What kind of ontology is new to Italian ontology? What is uh, uh, what 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 ontology we can find in, in Klaus Tenner, uh, Josef Ratzinger, in, uh, uh, in and, and, man, uh, and and others and other other uh, other thinkers? Uh, I think well. It, it, we can now ask the proper question for them and try to try to find answers. Since we, we, we now we can uh, we know what to, what to uh, what to look for in their in their um, in their works, and I think that the, in many cases there is an ambiguity in their uh, writings that uh, they do not they cannot decide what on or do not uh, ask them some this question. This question. Um, but uh, um, I, I would focus only in one discussion, and uh, since I'm very interested in Russian philosophy and this, this neo-patristic uh, movement, we have Vladimir Lovsky, uh, uh, and, and he, well, he's a, might be seen as an early proponent of, of this uh, ontological, uh, Trinitarian ontology, and he has a paper, uh, The Procession of the Holy Spirit in Orthodox um, uh, Trinitarian doctrine uh, published in this uh, in the collection on the um, on the image and likeness of God, and he very sharply contrasts two uh, approaches to Trinity: Western and Eastern. And Western is uh, is a view that in Trinity that the, the persons are reduced to relations, and the West and the Eastern, and this is a bad. Of course, a, this is a rather lost orthodox thinker, and he uh, he takes it as a, as a charge. But in in Western tradition, especially in acquiring us, there are not only relations between uh, persons, but the persons are relations. And this, uh, it, it's, it's, of, of course, it, it's true. But for him, it is a it is a charge because, according to Los, to Los, Loski, uh, good orthodox Eastern tradition says that they are two separate categories, not separate, but two distinct categories, relations and persons, and persons do not dissolve into relation. And this is absolutely clearly, he, he, he contrasts these two, these two uh, views, and we can, now we can read this as Forlos, I'm not sure whether, whether, whether he's right, but Forlos, he, uh, Western tradition would be radical structuralism, whereas for him, uh, in his reading, what, uh, Eastern tradition would be more moderate. It would be, uh, we need a, a category of person, and we cannot eliminate category of person. They are relations, of course, but the relations are, uh, the relations have terms, and the terms are not reducible, reducible to, uh, to relations. So it's, it looks like for him, uh, the Eastern tradition was much, was moderate, moderate structural realism. And I think it's, it's uh, well, it's, um, this, uh, this framework is, uh, is uh, powerful to, uh, to discriminate uh, different, different views in, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in this topic. And, um, and, and the, same, the same you can find in, uh, in many other uh, authors, orthodox authors. Uh, Carissus Ware, a famous uh, uh, British orthodox uh, uh, thinker. And uh, he also he, he compared Aquinas and Palamas, and, and he, he found uh, he found uh, le Palamas letter when where Palamas says that a uh, uh, letter to Daniel, um, uh, Palamas says that uh, uh, relations signify persons. Relation 
character, uh, introduce a characterized person, but do not, uh, do not uh, constitute persons. Persons are somehow, to some extent, independent and, uh, from uh, uh, relations. And the same we can, we can find in Zulas, John Zulas, or rather, we are in German, John Zitulas. I, I heard once this pronunciation. Uh, uh, John Zizoulas, which uh, famously uh, put together in, in the concept of personhood, we have uh, this one side, one aspect is, is this uh, 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 hypostasis, and the second was is ecstasis. And he, he, he insists that during the uh, Trinitarian discussion, we join, join to these two aspects into one, into one, uh, one idea of person. And it, it has this uh, dimension of substantial di dimension and this uh, relational dimension. Again, it seems like as if he accepts moderate structural realism in contrast to, uh, to Aquinas, who, who could be uh, underst understood as, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as radical uh, uh, structural realism. Uh, but in, uh, I'm not sure what I'm. We have time. Yes, two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, it's enough. Uh, uh, but, but also, we, we have also in um, in the Zola, we have also a, a very interesting discussion of the problem of individuation, which I think somehow undermines his uh, his own uh, view, uh, the previous view uh, of moderate sexualism. And um, since um, he uh, in in uh, not in being in communion, but in uh, Communion and Otherness is the next, the next book by Zulas. He, he uh, proposed uh, a view that uh, 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 persons are, are individuated by relations, and uh, that what constitutes our uniqueness is our uh, specific pattern of relations we have to other persons, especially to, uh, especially to God. And it sounds strikingly similar to, to the whole discussion about uh, individuation in structuralism, which is huge in analytic, analytical philosophy. And it suggests that if we are individuated by relations, it means that relations are somehow more important than this, uh, than objects. Since uh, it's, it's like in, in, in philosophy of mathematics to be, what, what is the difference between number four and number five uh, in, uh, in abstraction from relations. There is no difference. They are uh, individuated me only by relations. And the same is the now, surprisingly, this is a claim of, uh, of Zizoulas about persons, but this suggests that, well, if we had a separate uh, category of, sub of objects, we could use it to individuate persons. And if we individuate person merely by relation, it means it suggests rather more radical interpretation that uh, we are constituted constituted by by, uh, by relations. So I think it's uh, perhaps it's uh, ambiguity here, or perhaps it's uh, evolution of uh, Zizula's uh, view. But again, it is visible when we when we uh, cast light of analytical approaches and uh, discussions of, on on, uh, on individuation, and we can read. Again, this 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 uh, this, this in, in this um, in this in this framework, and there is a, a great discussion about philosophy because when we adopt structure and view, uh, and we do not dis discern between spiracio uh, uh, and uh, generatio, uh, these two relations, we have a, we have a problem because structural description of song and spirit is, is uh, exactly the same. Therefore. When we add, uh, and it, it was noticed by Harriet Baver, uh, a, a recent uh, <laughs> philosopher who wrote uh, a, a very interesting book on Trinity, an analytical book on Trinity, and she, and she su su suggested that when we add, because this, uh, this graph is uh, symmetrical, that is, uh, there are two objects which have exactly the same structural description, and when we add, when we add Kinyokfa, uh, when we add the, the next arrow, this graph is not symmetrical. So I'm not sure whether this, this was the, um, the reason to uh, accept Kinyokfa, uh, uh, but from the structural point of view, this is a, this is a good point. Now we have, with Kinyokfa, we have a uh, non-symmetrical non structure, and this uh, grounds uh, 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 
structural differences between three persons of, um, of, of Trinity. But the, the, the answer, the, uh, the orthodox answer is that um, we need not to introduce filioque because we have two radically uh, different relations, filas, uh, filiasio, and generasio. And we have no idea what was the difference between them, but we need to assume that they are different. So, again, the question of filioque, which is very important and uh, historically and uh, well nowadays and so that it might be uh, clarified with the help of uh, with the help of this uh, conceptual framework of of, of uh, okay so i think that's it's you know i just skip here yes it does this will ask you Okay, so that's that's enough for the introduction uh, a, a very possibility of Making bridge between uh, between uh, our topic that is Trinitarian ontology and completely different views, uh, um, um, artificially different, uh, uh, made by uh, developed by, by people who doesn't know about Trinity perhaps. Who, who, uh, Lady Man is is is, uh, is uh, absolutely far from the taste of philosophy. They they work in philosophy of mathematics or work in philosophy of of physics, but uh, I think that they uh, develop, the types of they develop might be very useful for our purposes. Thank you very much. Dr. Wojek, uh, would you be so kind to come here and uh, yes, to answer the question? So we have a, a discussion of the first two lectures this morning, so it's up to you to sit down here. Okay. And I think we should have now, yes, normally 20 minutes, but we are a bit, a bit late now. So between 15 and 20 minutes. So yes, now it's up to you, to the audience, to raise some questions to our two speakers. And first, questions um, of information, and the second questions of interpretation. So it's up to you now. Um, yes, maybe I can. Uh, yeah, you want to raise a question? The mic is of the online viewers. They can't hear you if you don't talk. Okay. I have to go there? Yes. Okay, sorry. That would be better. Okay, okay. Sorry. So, yes. Yeah. Now, we're opening the discussion. And um, the discussion of the first two lectures um, of um, Mr. Ryan Hacker and uh, Dr. Thank, thank you. Uh, and it's Ryan, up to you now. Please. Yeah, fantastic. Um, David Bennett from University of Oxford. Um, it's a question for Ryan Hacker. What would you say is the discontinuity and continuity, just as a general question, between the kind of platonic um, world of Parmenides and kind of the Christian deposit of Trinitarian ontology? It's a very open question. I just wanted to know from your paper, I really enjoyed it, but I was just trying to kind of grasp the points of discontinuity as well as the points of continuity. Um, so yeah, open question. Yes, thank you for your question. Um, in my paper, I presented an Origenian inspired Christian interpretation of Plato's Parmenides in which those points of discontinuity were overcome. So um, there are, of course, many points of discontinuity that have been explored by the Church Fathers and have been the topic of in this conversation ever afterwards. But the important point here, I think, is that the dialogues are um, so fecund with alternative interpretations that they admit and even encourage this, this play of creative rereading. So it's not the, the fact that um, Plato uses pseudonymity, that is, he speaks in other voices. And in this in dialogue, he speaks not only in the voice of Socrates, his teacher, but also of the teacher of Socrates, Parmenides, retrojects to the archaic past, to the mythic past, the possibility of rereading it for the future. And that's the purpose here. That is, we're not simply trying to be faithful to the way that Plato was expounding himself or Parmenides, because in fact, we find that Plato is creatively reinterpreting Parmenides in this dialogue, which encourages us as the reader to reinterpret it ourselves. Now, if I were to say what the biggest difference is, uh, I think actually we can find that difference already in late antiquity. If we look at, for instance, the way in which the 
Parmenides and the, the long theological tradition of rereading it uh, was interpreted by the pagan Neoplatonists. So what's exciting about Origen of Alexandria, depending on how you interpret the reports of his contact with Ammonius Saccas and with Plotinus, is that he is living in the same city and he's interpreting the Platonic tradition in a new way and in ways that are markedly contrary to the way that it was interpreted by Plotinus and his successors. So the very good news about this is that um, in uh, Proclus's commentary on Plotus Parmenides, which is the most extensive surviving commentary on the dialogue from antiquity, there's a commentary by Damascus, and I think there may have been some previously, but this is the most extensive one. We can observe the points of rupture here. And um, curiously, uh, there is a report in Proclus of Origen's interpretation of Plotus Parmenides. It may not be the Christian origin. I'll, I'll notice you of that. But nevertheless, he does give us some idea of how an origin would have interpreted this. Um, and the biggest point of rupture here is that the one is absolutely primary to the multiplicity of dialectical hypotheses and exercises in Proclus. There's no perichoretic relation between the between the, hypo the hypotheses interpreted as hypotheses. There's also no kenosis. There's no sense in which the inner meaning of the one is, is emptied and revealed through its relations that is given forth by the second divine hypothesis by the sun. And so we, we observe something quite radical in Origen's interpretation. Um, if you were to read as it were Origen's on first principles as a kind of late, later response to and reinterpretation of the of the dialectical question about hypotheses in Plato's Parmenides. Um, and as I've tried to interpret it, um, I, 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 I render the third hypothesis, that of um, that in which appears the sudden instant as that which is uh, the beginning of any inference across the categories of thought of any of the other hypotheses. And this means that every single dialectical hypothesis must be read in light of and in response to that which is revealed is shown from the instant. And if we were to read this in an Origenian or even arguably a sociological standpoint, we could say that this sudden instant is like the divine Sophia that from the beginning reveals to us the possibility of responding to revelation. And this I think is also relevant for our subsequent paper regarding the role of structural realism and formal ontology because from an from origin standpoint and from the standpoint of Trinitarian theology, there can never be any, any secular or alternative or autonomous standpoint from which we construct a formal ontology, whether it be formal logic or, or um, ontology of relations that stands apart from this, this revelatory gift of kenosis and of a perichoretic response amongst the divine apostasies of the Trinity and our own created and gifted response to it. Okay, thank you so much. There are two other questions, ladies first, I would suggest it then. Uh, Mr. Uh, so I'm San Malva from the University of Helsinki. Would you be so kind first to, to put your name just? Uh, San Urvas uh -huh. from the University of Helsinki. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you both of you for your very inspiring presentations. I have a question for uh, regarding the second one. Uh, could you please comment on uh, this radical OSR that you spoke about in relation to process philosophy or Charles Percy's pragmatism? Mm -hmm. Have you investigated the relations? Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, uh, does it work? Yeah. Okay, I think that uh, um, it is very typical for analytical philosophy that they develop some ideas with no knowledge and consciousness about history and about any other camps in, in philosophy. And I think that James Ladyman is, is a great example of such way of doing philosophy. And um, well, and even structuralism of uh, 60s in, in, in linguistic and in, in social theory is, is completely ignored and neglected in this in this view. So they they they, they uh, develop their ideas in, in isolation from 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 other. They, they just want to understand some data from from science and that's all. And and I think that uh, and. To, to my mind, to my knowledge, it's it's rather uh, different. Uh, of course, there, there are similar uh, similar um, insights, similar views with with many, especially in philosophy of of, um, of uh, in pragmatism. It, it cannot it can be found very si similar general views, but uh, well, uh, the, the um, evolution theory goes to, to that way that uh, this. General, general view is uh, 
concretized in, in very specific ontological theory. And I think this is, it is rather original. They, are, they say the same, perhaps very similar things, but in the language of formal ontology, in the language of relations, in the language, specific language of, uh, which I think is, is rather original. General views are common for many, uh, for, for many schools and, and perhaps in, in uh, process philosophy, which, which is not uh, taking into account in this discuss discussion, perhaps regret regrettably. But I think that the, the, this, this is rather original in this, in this uh, high specific level uh, of uh, solutions and, and proposed ontology. But general uh, simulators are, are obvious with, with many, many, other, uh, many other areas. Thank you so much. Well, this next question was just um, yeah. um, um, Maybe we can make the online question first, as I'm here already. Sorry? We have, we have an online question in the chat. The online question, okay, sorry. Yeah, I'm going of to course. Sorry. You have an excuse to say, yes. Yeah, I'm already Great, please. So, uh, for Ryan Hacker, could you please comment on the usefulness of holding on to this course of an alternate dialectics? After Hegel, if we at the same time identify Trinitarian ontologizing as a theological tendency emerging through the critic of Hegelian idealism, most notably in von Balthasar. Yes, um, what's incredible about the Parmenides is that it is, as Proclus observes, the point at which Hegel, the point at which Plato presents his method of dialectic or the way in which we pursue dialectical reasoning in the most extensive way. Um, it's been noted that it's the most uninterrupted series of argument in all of the platonic corpus. The, um, the, it goes on to something like uh, 16, 26 Stefanoff pages. And um, Plato, um, Hegel, uh, as I believe the, the, the questioner may recall, had mentioned at the conclusion of the preface of the phonology of spirit that he calls it the greatest work of antique dialectic. Now, what's exciting about this is that it presents not only a way of reasoning dialectically, uh, which is, in, as an example of it, is far more comprehensive and expansive than anywhere else in the Platonic Corpus, but in many ways also presents a counterpoint to the way that dialectic had been conceived of by, by subsequent Platonists as well as by later in the German idealist tradition by Hegel. Um, so well, there's a really interesting question that lies behind my interpretation, and I believe the questioner is drawing out, which is what would be the difference between the mode of dialectic that's presented in Plato's Parmenides and that which we find in Hegel, for instance, in the phenomenology of spirit or in the science of logic. And I sense that um, the great question that stands behind this is what do we think are the highest ideas of dialectic that unite the various relations and and movements of thought uh, within them. And the, the question here is, um, in what sense can, can Hegel's dialectic in the science of logic uh, be read as a creative development of the dialectic that's recommended by Plato's by, by Parmenides in, the, in Plato's Parmenides. Um, and in a certain sense, Hegel's asking the same kind of questions as Parmenides, which is, if we begin with an original supposition like the one, uh, what would that lead us to? What would be the, 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 the uh, paradoxical consequences of that original supposition? And uh, what would we have to assume once we come to those, that, that, that paradoxical impasse as an alternative standpoint from which to begin to reason again? Um, of course, uh, Hegel begins with the, the absolute indeterminacy of being and then proceeds through that to nothing and becoming and then through determinate being and so forth uh, through the successive categories of, of his science of logic. That being said, um, there is a very sort of similar sort of um, there's a very similar sort of beginning with the um, most original assumptions that from which we cannot think before or behind uh, to their paradoxical consequences and then think, think over them to successive um, beginnings of, of reasoning. Um, the difference, however, I think is, is, and this is, I think, a, a bigger question for, for, for Hegel scholars or for a theological interpretation of Hegel, is whether Hegel's dialectic, Hegel's science of logic is as open to a Trinitarian interpretation as Plato's Parmenides. And I suspect if you can formulate a Trinitarian rereading of Plato, you might do something similar with Hegel, and that may be our task for the future. Okay, next is the question of Okay, Mr. Nafti. And do you have some more online questions or not? Okay, okay. thank you. Jonas Nafti, Heidelberg. Um, thank you, Professor Rohr, for this, uh, Rory, sorry, for this very interesting and fascinating um, talk. I have a question regarding um, structuralism. Is it really possible to be radically structuralist and say that relations are all there really is, because, also in the Trinity? Because um, one problem that I've always had with Augustine, for example, is that for him the Holy Spirit is only the relation of unity between the God the Father and God the Son, 
and he's the, the um, vinculum amoris that bind, binds them together. And the first to see that this cannot work is Richard of St. Victor, because he says, no, it's not the relation of charity, but the Holy Spirit has to be a relatum as well. So there are three relata, and the relation of charity is God, and uh, not the Holy Spirit as one relation between two relata. So I'm asking, do we have to be moderately structuralist and acknowledge that relations only exist between relata, but relata only exist between their relations or in their relations to others? Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> um, well, the, the, the danger of this, uh, uh, yeah. the, the danger of this uh, uh, Augustine claim that uh, there, there is a father, there is son, and there is a relation between them which is called Saint Sp uh, Holy Spirit. Well, it, it is, uh, the, the, um, there's no equality because uh, if there are two terms and one relation, it, it's obviously, uh, does not, they're not equal, persons are not equal because they, they belong to different categories. But I think that's a very unfortunate, uh, unfortunate um, uh, claim uh, of Augustine. And when we look at, uh, at the, 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 the scholastic view, uh, but even in Augustine, when we have that, that um, um, uh, the doctrine of relation against Arianism, it is a part of uh, the Trinitata of, of Augustine, that is a very clear exposition of this idea that persons are uh, relational but and there is one step more to uh, to acquire this view and standard scholastic view that they are that we identify persons not they are not they, they are not only relations between persons but persons are re, are so deeply uh, permitted by relation that they are themselves relations of course there is uh, ambiguity here because and it is a crucial problem uh, often neglected by uh, commentators that the concept of relation in uh, Aristotle and in scholastics is different than a contemporary concept of relation. It goes from Russell, Frege, and uh, it's, it's, it's completely a contemporary concept. There is a huge difference between them, and we need to translate all the claims uh, concerning relations uh, in, in this classical classical language of Aristotle to contemporary language. It is very, it is rather difficult, but, but possible. And I think that, uh, and it, it was much easier for Aristotle, for, in this Aristot Aristotelian framework, to say that persons are relations, because relations was, was, were considered as uh, accidents with, with an in indication to the, to the other. So they were something more substantial than uh, uh, contemporary relations, which are between things. They are not rooted in one thing and pointing to, uh, to another, but they are simply between their uh, polyadic properties. And, um, and uh, but I think that I think that this this rather established tradition in in, in, in Western scholastic that we can speak about persons as relations considered in this in the framework of Aristotelian concept of relation. And, um, but in, in this radical structural realism, they uh, use this contemporary concept of relation, which is much more radical and much more uh, difficult to grasp. And even on this concept, they, uh, uh, they argue that it is possible to have only relations. Um, and well, um, so there, there, are many, there are many problems, but I think that this is, is um, this uh, class about uh, a relation of love, uh, which is often adopted by theologians, I think it's, it's, it's the worst way uh, of uh, speaking about Trinity, because it's very, however, it is, it is, it is rather popular. And, um, well, so my remarks are, 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 are such, and uh, I think that, uh, but the, the one point is very important, that there is a difference between uh, classical and, and contemporary concept of relation, and we cannot, we, we cannot, um, without discussion, jump from one uh, one uh, one context to, to another. But there, there is, I, I hope, there is a, a possibility to, trans to translate these categories one to another. Just an additional question, then we the next one. But uh, is it possible? Is it possible to uh, conceive relations consistently without related terms? Uh, <laughs> It, it, is, it is a similar question whether we can conceive properties without a, a bearers. Mm -hmm. 
And well, we, uh, when we have a sophisticated theory of bundle theory of substance that uh, objects are simply a collection of properties somehow related, then it is also possible to have a similar conception of uh, relations. Of, the idea is, 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 is especially in, in Ladyman, uh, relations have terms, but they are only conditional terms. When we look at terms, we then we then uh, find that these terms are constituted by relations to other terms, and the, these are the, the next terms are also uh, dissolved in in uh, following relation and so on. And this this has no there is no uh, ground level with uh, substances. Well, it is. You know, <laughs> ontology uh, teach us that there are so many strange theories, and this is one of them. Not, 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 not very radical, I think. But well, it is strange. Everything is strange. Every ontology is, uh, is something um, uh, uh, striking, and and this is one of uh, not one of the strikers, but but uh, uh, but uh, well, it is. It is. Uh, it has. A, we need to pay some for, for, for this. Uh, we need to adjust our intuition and, and um, uh, well, um, it might be controversial, but every kind of ontology is controversial at some level. So I think it's, it, it is one of the, uh, one of the, uh, in, in, in one of the possi possible conceptualization of the world. Thank you so much. There's one uh, question left, and I think then we should finish our discussion. Uh, Bernard Staller, University of Munich. I have a question to Mr. Hecker. You says in your lecture, the beginning of the theology is the thinking of Trinity. He says the beginning, the beginning of philosophy, the thinking about the creation of the world by God and his ordering wisdom. Oh, yes, I, if I understand correctly, are you asking about um, the difference between the beginning of theology and the beginning of philosophy? Uh, yes. yes. Well, I believe, um, I believe uh, Professor Rojek spoke about this uh, briefly, which was that um, that what distinguishes theology as a discipline from philosophy is its response to revelation. Uh, so that, uh, as, it were, as you were describing, um, we can approach from a philosophical standpoint theology by thinking of how we, we as it were, come to, be, to respond to and receive revelation. And um, what would distinguish a theological philosophy, as it were, would be a kind of philosophical response to revelation. Um, I think the, the challenge is that however we, we, we begin to respond to revelation, we must first have an idea of what revelation is. And this is where um, sort of the philosophical question returns. Um, that being said, um, what distinguishes Christianity, perhaps most radically, from all other religions is the idea of God become man in Jesus, the death of Christ on the cross, and the response that is given by the Christian community and the Holy Spirit. And in this sense, Christian theology is radically Trinitarian. Uh, the Trinity becomes a kind of name that we give for this processual movement of the kenosis of God emptying himself in man, and then um, the spiration and the, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the, um, the um, to, to the, the Christian community that is ever afterwards repeated uh, at, in the gift of charity within it. Um, so in this sense, I would say that um, we, we cannot really begin to interpret the beginning of the world unless we, 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 we already respond to the way in which that world has been shown to us, uh, whether it be in divine revelation or even in the, the, the fact the, the fact that we live in this world. And I should point out that um, in the Gospel of John, uh, there is itself a re-narration of, the, of the, the Genesis account of creation. So when they say that um, in the beginning was the word, the word was God, and the word was with God, and the word is God, um, it's to say that, that um, it's not simply God alone who creates the world out, as it were, um, out of the out of the void or out of the, the, the abyss, but rather that, that um, God always is with the word and the word that was God is God. And it is from the word that the world was created. The word being something more than just pure, simple um, name of God beyond being. Um, so I would suggest that we already have in the gospels a, a, a response to revelation and a, a re-narration of the beginning of the world that, that gives us the opportunity for a reinterpretation of philosophy from its origins in a new Christian way. Okay, thank you so much for both of you for <laughs> giving your answers to the questions and for the questioners. Thank you so much. We have, I would say, five minutes, not more, for reasons of time. Five minutes coffee break now, and then we will have, I hope so, the lecture, the keynote lecture of Professor Milburn.